Welcome to the people who are tuning in right now to Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations. I'm so excited for this conversation, been waiting for it for a while, and lots to talk about. Uh, for those who don't know, Manny's is a physical gathering space in the Mission District in San Francisco. We had to shut down, unfortunately, because of the shelter in place. But just because the physical place is closed does not mean that the work of civically engaging our public is over. We have work to do. So we decided to build this online series, and today you are in it. You are a part of it. And so I want to thank you, whoever you are, uh, for joining. And if you don't mind raising your hand, there's a little button that is a hand raise button. I'd love to see who's here uh, and just kind of get a sense of who's in the audience. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Please keep raising your hands. Thank you. If you like what you're hearing, or if you don't like what you're hearing, you can tag us at Welcome to Manny's at any time. Um, and if you have a question for George uh, on the topic or on anything, you can type that question into the Q&A box at any time. This is a 30 minute program. We're gonna talk for 15, 20 minutes, and then we're gonna get to your questions. All right, is everyone ready? I can't hear you, but I'm just gonna hope that you are. George, are you ready? I'm ready. Fabulous. Your name is George Jacob. Yeah. You are a man of mystery to me. <laughs> I'm so interested in what you do. I plan and design museums. So that has been my vocation for many years now. How does one find that vocation? I mean, it's such a specific thing to do. How did you get into this? Well, somebody has got to do it. But um, I, I, um, I graduated with the museum studies background and uh, I was always interested in the establishment of new museums. So rather than working in an established museum, I was more interested in the design build side of the industry. Mm -hmm. So I kind of focused more on establishing, master planning, designing museums. What do you think makes a successful museum experience? I think the bottom line is that as long as it resonates either with the people or with its mission, uh, that's the definition of success. If it can inspire a generation, that is success times two. If it is timeless and inspires more generations than one, uh, and you can actually see the fruits of what the museum does for them and their lives, I think that's uh, times three. Well, so right now we have, I'm just trying to like lay out the architecture and I'm gonna ask you just so you know about where we've been, where we are and where we're going. But I feel like, let's put um, zoos aside for a second. Um, I feel like with museums, you've got art museums. Actually, no, let's bring the zoos back. In terms of these like physical places that people go to learn and kind of be acculturated, you have your art museums and you've got, you know, your classic art, your modern art, your contemporary art. You have your places with animals in them. So you've got your aquariums and your zoos and your, I don't know, parrot jungle in Florida kind of thing. Um, and then you have uh, like educational institutions that maybe are like, they don't, they don't have art in them, but they're like places where you go and you like grow and learn, kind of like Cal Arts and Sciences, the Exploratorium, these places that are like maybe more about seeing and doing and learning. Can you tell me, one, did I miss anything? And then two, kind of how have you seen the evolution of these spaces from when you began in this industry, and I know you've been in it for a while, to where we are now? So a long time ago, you know, they started with libraries. So right. in second BC, the library in Alexandria was um, deemed to be the first of its kind, first museum. And then after the uh, World Expo in 1857, the Crystal Palace exhibit became a museum. And then each year, wherever the expo happened, you know, there was a clamor for preserving uh, some of the collections. And then from the collections, they kind of grew as institutions of learning and they had activities and outreach efforts and so on and so forth. And from being passive sources of learning, they became more interactive. From interactive sources of learning, they became more immersive. Mm -hmm. And with immersive sources comes the entire family of AR, VR, and all the okay. cyber curation that you can think of. So the museum as we kind of maybe think to know it is really like an, an invention of the last 150 years. Is that what I hear right from you? In, in modern terms, yes. Uh, but if you look at 
their fundamental function as learning institutions, they've been in existence for a very long time. Right. So it started off as cabinet of curiosities. You would keep a three-headed snake or five-legged cow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you had the, uh, the, the mishmash of curios. And then eventually, once the curatorship process became more sophisticated, the interpretive planning became more sophisticated, you had you know, museums as formalized institutions of public learning. And what about the, um, the kind of museum-like place that you find yourself in in the Bay Area, which is in the aquarium and kind of aquatic side of things? When did aquariums really start to become a thing? What's the oldest aquarium out there? What was the first aquarium? One of the first aquariums was in New Zealand, in Auckland. And uh, interestingly, the Aquarium of the Bay is modeled after uh, that particular aquarium. And there were three aquariums built in, the, in, in California that were modeled after the New Zealand model. And when it started here in San Francisco, it was a for-profit organization called the Underwater World. Hmm. And, um, it became a nonprofit about 10, 11 years ago. And then it changed its name to Aquarium of the Bay. It became a nonprofit. Got it. I have to tell you, George, um, when I was in grade school, I was in Jewish school, I don't remember how old I was, but I went to on a trip to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and it totally blew my mind. I mean, I remember it so vividly and going to the petting pools and uh, then we went to some tidal pools and an octopus wrapped around my hand and I'm, I'm 30 years old now and I still remember that moment so well and having so much wonder and like, I can't believe there's an oct and it peed on me. And I was like, everyone laughed and I just, it totally, it, it, it excited me so much. And so I want, I want to ask you a little bit about the utility of these spaces, especially as it relates to inspiring young people, kind of what you see in your work actually running and creating um, all these museum spaces, uh, you know, all over the place. Well, specifically aquariums, um, you know, Aquarium of the Bay has been sort of a boutique aquarium for the last 24 years. And um, you observe all kinds of people fascinated by just the wonder of what the oceans offer in terms of biodiversity, aquatic life, and how these species interact with each other. You know, that has endless wonder. And Mm -hmm. especially when you see little babies, you know, they stop crying. And they're so fascinated by what's going on, especially in our tunnels. So that is quite a gratifying sight. But post wonder, I think, um, you know, what really hits home is our engagement with this amazing biodiversity. What are we doing as a species to uh, either make their lives more difficult or uh, how are we actually helping uh, turn the tide, pun intended, uh, so that, you know, we, uh, we have a better uh, world that we live in, mm-hmm. especially now with the Earth Day approaching next week. You know, that is uh, very much on many people's minds. Right. So uh, I'm going to get tough with you a little bit, okay? I'm going to ask some tough questions. First, let's start with museums. I feel like, uh, especially in my generation, you know, people like to go to museums, but, but I do feel like there's a sense that the traditional museum, if you walk into a big white building and you just stare at a a painting for a while and then you sit on a bench, maybe you get a cappuccino and you leave. I feel like people are starting to get kind of bored of that. Do you feel like the traditional art museum model is shifting and do you think it has to shift in order to stay relevant? It is shifting. You know, it is significantly shifting. There is some value in the classical. Um, You know, there is no substitute for uh, for that sort of um, a, a presence. Uh, They are collective repositories of memory, collective repositories of talent, culture, heritage. So they they have a sort of a uh, a sanctity which is important in the conventional sense. Mm -hmm. What is happening more and more is that um, they are seeking new audiences. Right. They they want relevance. They want uh, to resonate with, you know, a younger audience. And the younger audiences are increasingly getting impatient. You know, they have... Uh, you know, this device at their fingertips mm-hmm. where curated information is presented to them at lightning speeds. So they don't really have the patience to wait for 18 months for a curated show to appear 
in a gallery. They'd rather look at it now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are some of the basic challenges that the museums are facing, the conventional museums are facing, mm -hmm. as they embrace new audiences and they look to new sources of revenue. How do you see, let's move to the, the organic world. Um, I have two questions about both zoos and aquariums. And, and I imagine looping the two things together is a mistake. So if it, if it is, please, please correct me. But one, I feel like aquariums and zoos attract families. But like, how do you get, first of all, like, is that true? Do you see like, is, are your attendees typically, you know, young adults, children and parents and if that is true, how do you attract, like, you know, the folks who are 20 to 40? Right. So museums, you know, you have the nonprofit aquariums, for example, and then you have the for-profit aquariums that are owned and run by companies like Merlin. <clears throat> and uh, some of them are located inside shopping malls or they are in multi-use hubs where there is commercial activity all around them. Mm -hmm. And the aquarium becomes a byproduct of a captive audience be it Legoland or, you know, some of those other locations. Right. But the, the classical aquariums like the Shedd Aquarium or the uh, Georgia Aquarium or the Frost Aquarium in uh, Florida and so on, they have a larger purpose. I mean, there is, of course, you know, they hold a million gallons, to get two million gallons of salt water. They also have freshwater tanks. They also have terrestrial species so that they co-link the coexistence of all uh, life forms, and they kind of tell a bigger story, mm -hmm. be it a story about climate, be it a story about carbon sequestration, uh, sea level rise, or ocean acidification, or microplastics, mm -hmm. and how our intervention has created problems or solved problems for, uh, for the next generation. So I think the storylines are shifting. Mm -hmm. In terms of how to attract a younger generation, which is a little bit more tech savvy, uh, aquariums are uh, resorting to a few interesting things. You know, there are um, fun activities where you can actually doodle on, uh, on on a screen and that pops up as a live uh, animal that floats or swims. Um, there are outreach activities where you use this sort of a Zoom uh, method of um, classroom-based teaching mm -hmm. um, that makes it more affordable and more quick. You can actually collate it with multiple sites yeah. in the Pacific or in the Far East and so on and so forth. And then um, there is this immersive medium of uh, virtual reality and sometimes combined with augmented reality uh, that allows for a different experience, a different right. kind of experience. So we do have an AR platform that we use at the aquarium in Pier 39. Cool. And, and uh, it, it allows you interactions with polar bears, with harbor seals, uh, and, and dinosaurs for that matter. Amazing. Um, I have three more questions, if you'll allow it. And then if, if for anyone that's tuning in, if you have a question for George Jacob, the international man of aquarium mystery, you can type it into the Q&A now. I want to talk about the treatment of animals. Is there a way to, to inspire the same set of wonder and experience the natural world without having to keep all these animals in these cages? I mean, it can't be comfortable even for the fish to like, you know, be in these small boxes. And I always feel like I enjoy going to the zoo and to an aquarium, but then I feel bad for these animals that are like stuck in tiny boxes. You know what I mean? Right. So I think that question is uh, one of the uh, eternal questions that have made um, aquariums and zoos adopt and adapt to uh, spatial challenges. Um, they're also acutely conscious of um, uh, protecting preserving and conserving um, uh, the biodiversity and especially bringing it to uh, you and I so that we are more aware of the challenges that some of these animals face right. uh, outside of the protective premise. Yep. Um, in many of these organizations, these are rescue animals. So they've been rescued from uh -huh. a fire or from a uh, polluted environment. Uh -huh. So it becomes a safe haven for, you know, some of those species. I didn't know that. Uh, I thought that they were like plucked from the wild from their mama. Um, I didn't realize that there are a lot of safe animals. Well, that's good to know. I wish I, I it's good that I, it's good that I know that. Um, the Bay Ecotarium, 
holy shit. I mean, like, what is this thing? I had no idea this was a thing, George. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know it was gonna happen. I didn't know what it looked like. First of all, it's gorgeous. Like, as someone who designed spaces, not me, you, it's just like, I'm gonna be so proud of it when it's up in the bay. So tell us about the Bay Ecotarium. Um, yeah, tell us about it. like, what is it? What's the plan? When is it gonna get built? And um, what's it gonna look like? So Bay.org uh, or Bay Equitarium as we call it now, has six branches. So Aquarium of the Bay is one of them. The Sea Lion Center, the Bay Institute, Studio Aqua, and uh, the Bay Academy are some of the branches of Bay.org. About three years ago, we decided to do a master plan to rethink the Aquarium of the Bay, which is, as you know, a bit dated, and it has its challenges, both physical challenges and it has functional challenges and operational challenges as well. So we decided to rethink and rethink out of the box a solution that could address a number of things. There you go, that's the, uh, the, the vision for the new center. And uh, we came up with this uh, climate and ocean conservation living uh, equatorium, uh, which hosts and accommodates the, aqu uh, the aquarium of the bay at its, at its core. Um, so currently the aquarium holds 750,000 gallons of salt water. That would be up to 1.5 million gallons, 2 million gallons. And then there is a, uh, a lecture space and so on and so forth. This is going to completely transform the skyline of San Francisco for the right reasons. It will position the city as a champion for climate, ocean conservation. It has a mandate of providing free education to more than 250,000 children a year. It has some of the best minds in the world as our ambassadors and advisors, including Dr. Sylvia Earle, NASA astronaut Dr. Yvonne Cagle, and the guru of emergency medicine, Dr. Paul Auerbach. It has some of the best uh, minds in the world working on it, some of the best designers from Germany, France, and Japan working on the core content and the immersive environments that are going to be inside the center. The interesting part about this center is that it uses Native American voices. There are about 96 tribes that have lived in the Bay Area for centuries. And some of their voices and some of their indigenous practices for environmental stewardship have never seen the foreground of the sort of leadership. So grounding that story in the Bay Area is really critical to us. And you know, using some of those voices to talk about conservation and environmental sustainability, especially as DG goals 14, 13, 17, and 19, mm -hmm. that focus on environmental justice. Those are sort of key elements of um, this premise. The building itself is a lead platinum building. It's designed like a, a combination of Poloni shell mounds and uh, the ocean geometry and fish scales. So it's got that iridescence. And um, geometry allows us to construct this um, edifice uh, as a prefab. So those of whom you're looking right behind where I'm sitting, uh, this is sort of the, uh, uh, the building that you can see at the back of where I'm sitting. You get a sense of how this building is laid out. Cool. Between piers 35 and 39. So is this, will it be where the existing Aquarium of the Bay is or is this a new space? It's the existing space, but the footprint uh, expands a little eastward. I see. So it are you going to de um, demolish the current aquarium to build this one? Parts of it. So right. the periphery of the current aquarium will be demolished. Mm -hmm. The tunnels, the classical tunnels that we have will remain with this life support system. And the, the canopies, and the shells will actually gird it or, or, or cover it. I see, I see. And how close, like, what stage are you guys in? Clearly the space has been designed, has it been funded? Um, has construction begun? Like, where, what stage are you at? So on October 5th, uh, 2018, we unveiled this design to the public for the first time. Um, Mrs. Uh, Biden, Jill Biden was here uh, for the opening ceremony. Amazing. Uh, of the unveiling ceremony of the design. And subsequent to that, we've actually held about 130 uh, public and private presentations to solicit community input. And we've received some really valuable input from our neighbor, neighborhood groups and other community organizations. We've received some great support from SFSU, from UC Berkeley, and from Stanford, and some of the other organizations. 
Great. And we are now in the permitting process. So the process is likely going to take about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, we, uh, we hope that we can uh, start working on the actual um, construction fabrication of exhibits and the, and the shell. Amazing. Um, this is my last question, and it's about kind of bringing us to today. George, you know, we may be reopening the city soon. Uh, of course, with lots of restrictions. Um, you run many spaces, I think six, uh, that are all kind of about gathering, you know, in person. And so how are you thinking about this? Are you nervous? Um, are you worried about the future and the sustainability of these important spaces in our city's life, given that, you know, we may, we may be seeing six to 12 months of people not wanting to gather in person in large groups uh, anymore? No, that's certainly a concern. As you know that uh, the American Alliance of Museums canceled their uh, San Francisco uh, 2020 Expo. No. Parts of it will go virtual, but um, the physical sort of gathering of 5,000 professionals or 8,000 professionals. I ah, think. where was it gonna be? Um, it was largely at Moscone Center uh, between May 17th and 21st. Damn. Um, so May 17th is the International Museum Day so I think now that entire focus will be virtual. So I think most museums, and, and some of you may know that San Francisco has 55 museums. And uh, yeah, it has about 55 museums and together they attract about 10 million people, 10 times the population of the city. And San Francisco as a city attracts 23 million to 25 million tourists a year. So museums are real anchors of tourism based economy they are anchors of augmented education and they are anchors of employment. So both during construction, post-construction. So I think there is a concern about dipping numbers. We are going to see some, uh, some shifts in the way the museums manage some of their operations with minimum resources. Um, you may have read in the Chronicle that there have been layoffs at the Exploratorium or Cal Academy. And uh, we are not exempt from that either. We've, we've had to lay off 70% of our staff. Wow. Open, it'll be a phase sort of uh, an increased uh, staffing level. But the proximity of, um, uh, you know, visitors once we open is a concern. So our teams have put together a protocol of how the operations will be managed, how health and safety will be taken care of, both for our own staff and for the, for the visitors. Mm -hmm. And then we are shifting a lot of our activities online. Mm -hmm. So education programs, uh, teaching programs, um, and some of those fun activities will shift online. Got it. Um, my final question is, I heard that the otters are sad. What's going on with the otters? Are they sad? The otters are still playful. Uh, we have four siblings, um, and they spend a lot of time sleeping. So they sleep about 16 hours a day. That's a lot. But when they wake up, they are little dynamos. They, uh, they're very, very active. So we have river otters. Uh, as you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has uh, sea otters. And we yeah, have river yeah. otters. So, so it's uh, fun and frolic when they're awake. So, but I heard that they're sad that there's no people around. Is that true? Well, our animal care team's trying to uh, keep them busy and engaged uh, with new toys and uh, new places where, where their food is kept. And so they try to exercise their minds a little bit and bodies a little bit too. Okay, let's try to get, let's get to some of these questions. Thank you for answering my George, mine. Uh, Jess asks, what do you think is the biggest threat to the sustainability and future of museums? The biggest threat is uh, relevance. So, mm -hmm. you know, for museums to be viable, they have to be relevant to the demographic that they serve. And um, relevance is tied um, one to the qualitative aspect of learning and education and enriching your soul and getting inspired. But on the quantitative side, you know, the dollars and cents uh, take center stage. And museums, as you know, have, not all of them have good endowments. A rainy day like uh, a forest fire or COVID exposes that vulnerability of museums. And they have to rethink their business model. They have to rethink on how they engage with the communities. They also have to rethink the kind of voices that they have either with city administration or with the county mm. because you know most cities and counties have a travel association or a travel-based promotion organization like SF Travel in San Francisco and Visit California and Sacramento 
that takes care of promoting travel. But the voices for museums need a special place, especially the nonprofits. Yeah. Because sometimes the conversation focuses mostly on hotels and motels and some of the allied sectors and museums don't get that same sort of a bandwidth. Got it. David Henke asks, what are your thoughts for the future of hands-on experience for tactile exhibits that you find in science and children museums, children's museums? So I think tactility is a great part of learning. You know, all the five senses contribute to the learning processes. That, that it's, octopus on my hand, remember? I can, I'm never gonna forget it. Indeed, so the suction cups and you know, all of those <laughs> things are so memorable that it, it uh, kind of touches your core. And especially children are fearless, especially between six and nine, they will touch and feel all their surfaces and that's how they imbibe um, knowledge and that's how they associate with their environments. So I think there is no substitute for those uh, sensory inputs. Mm. And institutions like the Exploratorium uh, that offer wonderful tactile experiences or multi-sensory experiences uh, will be here uh, as long as you know, we are relishing you know, childhood environments and childhood inputs. Of course, uh, the biggest threat, of course, is uh, what is happening in the cyber world. More and more children, especially this particular generation, is uh, the screen age generation. They have not grown without a screen in front of their faces. So their sense of what is real and what is virtual is increasingly getting blurred. That's so sad. I hate it. I think it's destroying us. Sangeeta asks, the, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has a bunch of guidelines for zoos and aquariums on enclosure sizes, ethical treatment of animals, etc. Do you believe that these guidelines are enough? And if not, what do you think needs to improve? I think the guidelines are very comprehensive. Uh, there is a very, very capable team at AZA that crafts and discusses and solicits input before some of these guidelines are made part of the accreditation process. Um, we are accredited by the AZA. There are 230, 35 aquariums and zoos that are accredited by the AZA. And these, the, uh, the process is really stringent. It is uh, it's a very thorough vetting process and it's very stringent. And there are subsequent reviews uh, even after you get the accreditation. Mm -hmm. So, and the, and the professionals on the other side also take it very seriously. Okay. And they, they follow some of these guidelines and practices very, very seriously. So, okay, I think we have time for one more question, my friend, and it's from, um, oh my God, wait a second. Melissa says that if anyone wants to check out the river otters, romp and play, you can view them through our live webcam. Melissa, where's this webcam? Can you, can you type in the question, or George, where's this otter webcam? So Melissa Schwest is our director of animal care. Hey, Melissa. <laughs> and she is, uh, She's been at the aquarium for many years and she and her team have been really, really good all through the COVID crisis. They have been here 24 seven, taking care of Maybe. a very large number of animals and 186 species that we have. Damn. Hey Sam, can you find the otter webcam and put it in the chat box, please? Thank you. Um, Randy asks, last time I looked, many of the newest and most remarkable modern museums are located in the Middle East. Which museums in the United States would you recommend visiting? that would represent the best of what to expect in the future? Ooh, interesting question. So the Middle East, you know, three comments. I mean, Saudi Arabia has um, the Museum of World Cultures. Uh, Dubai has, of course, uh, Ferrari World. Um, and some of the, uh, most recently, the Museum of the Future that is coming up in Dubai. It was supposed to make a debut at the Expo 2020 that got postponed. But that is a phenomenal 3D printed, massive uh, setup it is worth a, a visit. 3D printed, 3D printed museum? Yeah, the building is 3D printed. It's a very sophisticated project. That's crazy. What's it called? The museum it's of called the, the museum, museum of the Future. Oh my God, I'm, I can't wait to look it up. Yeah, and then uh, of course the Sadiat Island has six phenomenal museums, uh, about $300 million a piece. So yes, some of the finest and the best museums are coming up in uh, Doha, Qatar, and other places. And in the U.S., of course, uh, the museum movement has been on um, a slightly slower pace. Uh, but there are some interesting museums that are coming up in New York and uh, Seattle and elsewhere, uh, focused on popular culture and some of the other unusual topics. Um, and, you know, with the time, they'll continue to evolve. George Lucas 
is setting up as we speak, the Museum of the Narrative Art in Los Angeles. Uh, that is going to be phenomenal when it opens. And um, the other museum that is about to come up is the uh, Oscars Academy of Motion Pictures Museum. Oh, yeah. I saw them. I saw the space for it. I'm from LA, and I saw the the building that they chose. Um, and then there's also that, build, that there's that big art museum that the Waltons are building, isn't it? Aren't they? Yes, the the Waltons Art Museum is called the Crystal Bridges Museum, uh, that was designed in uh, by in Bentonville by architect Moshe Safdie, mm -hmm. and uh, that has been around for a while. Uh, but again, it is a campus, a phenomenal campus, uh, that accommodates both uh, classical and contemporary art. Can I tell you what museum I've always wanted to go to, but I've never been able to? Yes. Okay, I'm going to tell you two things. I'm going to tell you the, my favorite museum that I've ever been to, and then the museum that I've always wanted to go to, but I haven't been to, okay? My favorite museum that I've been to, and I, I'm obsessed with, is the Victorian Albert Museum. I love the Victorian Albert, Albert Museum, which will kind of reveal a little bit about me, but I just think it's so gorgeous, and they open it up on Friday nights, and they play live music in the courtyard, and... I met this amazing guy in the um, Raphael room. Have you ever been in the Raphael room? Yes. Ah, oh, it's so amazing. Yes. And I forget his name, but he was also amazing. Anyway, that was the Victorian Albert. My, my, the museum I've always wanted to go to, but I've never been, is the Milwaukee Art Museum, because I love Calatrava, and I want to see the bird. Can you tell people about the Milwaukee Art Museum? Right, so the Santiago Calatrava is a master of architectural geometry, and uh, of course, the bird is a phenomenal, unique institution. It actually contributes to a kinetic sculpture. Mm -hmm. And you see some of the similar Calatrava installations in Toronto and also in, um, in Spain. Oh, yeah. no, yeah, in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, Bill, I'm mis I, I'm, oh, I think I'm messing it up. Anyway, I want to ask you two hard questions. What's your favorite museum to visit that you're not responsible for? And what's your favorite marine animal in the aquarium? Well, I like the seven gill sharks. Um, they have not evolved in millions of years, and I am fascinated by watching them. And um, my favorite museum is actually, um, where I've not been involved with. That's not um, one of your museums, George. <laughs> I, I saw a very small museum of course, the, the big ones, of course, are there. You have the, uh, the Bilbao by the Guggenheim, yeah. Um, yeah, by Frank Gehry. Uh, and then you have the Louis Vuitton Museum by Frank Gehry outside of Paris. And of course, the Louvre, you know, there are so many of those big ones that are, that are interesting and you know, fantastic. But some years ago, I was in Zagreb in Croatia. And I saw a very small museum called the Museum of Broken Relationships. <gasps> And what made that museum special was, of course, the smallness and the intimacy of the size. Uh, but what was interesting was the curation process. So it was a story of uh, broken relationships, not just between two people, but also with uh, neighborhoods, with communities, with balkanization, with war, how it has broken up communities and neighbors uh, for generations. And those stories are told uh, in very personalized uh, voices, um, sometimes with a tinge of humor, sometimes with a tinge of sadness, but it, it did leave a lasting impression on me. So sometimes, you know, budgets alone don't equate to uh, the resonance. Right. right. Well, George, that, this is the end of our time. I just want to point uh, to the folks who are tuning in. If you go to the chat, uh, there is a GoFundMe in the chat to help the Aquarium of the Bay uh, care for its marine life, help support our marine life, help Melissa uh, do her amazing work. We've also included the Twitch to watch the otters play from 10 to noon every day. You can watch the otters play. And finally, I do want to make a request that you uh, go into the chat box and click on joinit.org slash o slash Manny's to become a sponsor of Manny's. I am 12 sponsors away from my big goal of how many sponsors we wanted to get in order to sustain our space. 12 away, so I really hope, I love making my goal, and we need 12 more. Um, it's $36 a month. You can go to joinit.org slash o slash mannies, or you can go in the chat box. The link is there. I want to thank my staff, my amazing staff, uh, Jupiter, Ram, and Sam, and Sam is the operator on this call. I want to thank you all for tuning in on this Friday evening to hear from 
one of the one of the treasures of San Francisco, George Jacob, um, and also he's a treasure because he runs the treasures of our city. Um, if you haven't gone to the Aquarium of the Bay, go. If you're willing to donate um, or become a partner or sponsor to the Bay Ecotarium, go to bay.org. It's really exciting and interesting. And um, be a doer, be a supporter, and help you know, allow future kids like me when I was a you know, be inspired by octopuses and all that, octopi. And uh, that's it. George, do you have any final words? No, thank you so much for, um, you know, making this happen. I'm sure uh, we'll have more questions. Uh, please log on to our website. It is uh, very simple, bay.org or bayequitarium.org or aquarium of the bay.org. All right. Thank you, thank you, George. For... Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and have a wonderful weekend as much as you thank can. You. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.